So I just wanted to start by talking about reality. You know, what, what is real? Um, because, you know, I guarantee that there's not a single person in this room that sees things for what they truly are. And it's very important that we acknowledge that fact and that we keep an open mind. And it's hard to do when we're taught from very young that you know, we live in a Newtonian world where everything is, follows natural laws. You can go to the rooftop of any you know, building and drop a ball off and we can tell you, you know, how fast that ball is going to accelerate, the force with which it's going to strike the ground, even how high it's going to bounce. And we think that that's what the, that's what world, the world is. But everything that we know from a religious perspective tells us that there's much more to things than that. And I'm speaking of you know, the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. And his life, he, he raised people from the dead. You know, he caused blind people who had never seen to see, deaf people to hear. He multiplied loaves and fishes. He calmed storms with just his words. He walked on water. And when he died, he rose from the dead. Where is Newtonian physics answer for any of those things? So I believe that it's very important for us to maintain an open mind and to question what reality really is. In reading in the Book of Mormon, there was a day when the Nephites looked up into the sky and they saw something there that shocked them to the point that the entire nation falls to the ground and they're astounded with what they've seen. Now, these are people who have developed the most advanced cal you know, calendar in the world. They knew that this, you know, Earth was going around the sun. I mean, they knew so many of these things and yet they're astounded by what they see in the heavens and collapse as a result. And indeed, Life only goes back to normal once they can debunk what they've seen and attribute it to somehow what we saw was Satan or men somehow did this and uh, you know, it's, it's not real so we can go back to how life was before. The Jews, they focused their life probably more than any other group of people on the God of Israel. Everything they did was about the Lord, the clothing that they wore, the food that they ate, the way they kept time, their holidays and festivals, you know, the sacrifices that they would make in the temple. Everything pointed them towards the God of Israel. And yet, the God who they professed to know when he came they did not know him. Is there something that we can learn in this? Why didn't they know him? You know, most Bible scholars estimate that less than 2% of the Jews would go on and become Christians. And yet everything was about the God of Israel, and they missed it. I thought a lot about that, how that could happen. And I think that it's important for us to contemplate how that could have happened. How could an entire nation who professed to know the God of Israel not know him when he arrived? Well, I think there's many reasons for that. I think that probably one of the most important reasons is that the Jews, very early on in their history, they outsourced their religious education to other people. I mean, just days after going through the Red Sea and entered into the, you know, the wilderness of you know, Sinai, the Lord comes to Moses and says, gather up my people. I want to talk to them. I want them to know that I am their God and they are my people. So Moses gathers the people up at the base of Mount Sinai, also Mount Horeb. And according to the book of Numbers, there's some 600,000 Israelites. So they're there at the base of the mountain waiting for the Lord. And as they're waiting, 
the mountain begins to shake and tremble. And they see smoke and steam rising from the mountain itself. And a big dark cloud descends over the peak of the mountain. And there's thunder and there's lightning. And they begin to hear trumpets. And Israel is terrified. And so they run towards the other side of the valley. And Moses says, stop. This is your God. He wants to talk to you. And they say, Moses, you go talk to him. If we hear him, we'll die. And in that day, Israel outsourced their education to someone else. That was not what the Lord intended. He wanted to speak to his people. Are we seeking to be taught by the Lord? Or is everything that we know about him coming from the lips of someone else, just like us? Is that the, the best, when you talk about good, better, best? What's the best form of spiritual education? Is it not the spirit itself? When I, I cannot believe that there were not Jews that would hear Jesus Christ talk and go, holy smokes, what is this? This doesn't make any sense compared to what I've been raised as, but what is this feeling? Some people would do that. Other people would go to their rabbi and say, tell me what I should do. And he said, listen, this guy, he's possessed of the devil. That's how he's doing all this stuff. What other explanation could there be? So it's very important that each of us seek to be taught for ourselves from the Lord. If we are not, we are living beneath our privileges. Elder Bednar in a general conference said, listen, if all you or I know about the restored gospel or about Jesus Christ is what we learn from other people, then our foundations are built on sand. And that is what the Jews had done. They had built a foundation on sand. All of these things that they were focusing on, they couldn't see the forest for the trees. Can we learn from them? This is a passage from Doctrine and Covenants. Listen to what it says. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord, first among those who have professed to know my name and have not known me. This is exactly what happened to the Jews. They professed to know the Lord, and they did not know him. So as we talk about these things today, I want you to, you know, I love Brandon's analogy of the maybe table. There's not just a yes or no table. And not everybody who heard Christ at the beginning and ultimately decided to follow him knew who he was right away. Some people had to study it out. Some people just knew right away, like Peter, when Christ is talking to his apostles and says, who, who, do, who do men say that I am? And there's all these different explanations. And Christ says to Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ says, blessed art thou, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. We need to, be, we need to seek to be taught by our father. Now, the Jews, they loved to quote their lineage as qualifying them as being special. And when they said this to Jesus, hey, Abraham's our father. We're covenant people. Christ said something very interesting back. He said, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. As I was contemplating how to present the subject matter that I want to go over today. I was impressed that talking about Abraham was the best way to go about it. So what are the works of Abraham? What was Abraham's life like? What did he know? What was his reality? How was that different from ours? And what can we learn about that? Or is there anything? Oops. I love this picture of Abraham, so I just want to show it. Look at that. Um, I think the best source for learning about Abraham is from Abraham's writings himself. This is coming from um, the Pearl of Great Price, this first verse I want to uh, cover, um, Abraham 1, verse 1. And it says, 
in the land of the Chaldeans at the residence of my fathers. So we know that Abraham is a multi-generational resident of the land of the Chaldeans. I, Abraham, saw that it was needful for me to obtain another place of residence. Well, if we want to understand a little bit more about Abraham, we need to understand about the land that he had lived in and his family for generations, and that's the land of Chaldea. So I don't know how well you can see this map, but he lived in Ur, which is right there. And all of these cities on this map are associated with the ancient civilization of Sumer. And Sumer is an absolute archeological outlier because it appears on the scene at the dawn of recorded history as a fully advanced civilization. Where everyone else are hunters and gatherers, Sumer arrives with canals and streets and apartment buildings and you know, advanced irrigation systems and a fully written language. And I mean, they've deciphered cuneiform tablets that show that these guys had calculated um, Jupiter's exact orbit around the sun. I mean, these guys were different. Their language is totally different from any other language family on the planet. This is where Abraham is coming from. Now, the Chaldeans, you know, Sumer was a civilization that, you know, it, it was destroyed. It was a pre-Diluvian civilization. So the Chaldeans, their claim to fame was going to the lands where the Sumerians inhabited and understanding the knowledge that they had. Um, and, you know, an example of this in the scriptures is, comes from uh, uh, the book of Daniel. Daniel 1, 3, 4. Listen to this. And the king spake that Ashpenaz should bring certain of the children of Israel well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. So the Chaldeans were, the, the knowledge base that they had was the envy of the ancient world. Assyria conquered these lands. Then Babylon, uh, Babylon conquered these lands. And the, the Chaldeans were always held up as being special because of the knowledge that they had. So now, let's read the next verse from uh, Abraham's writings. And it's important to understand that Abraham is writing this at the end of his life. And he's doing it for our benefit. And this is what he says. Oops. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> and finding there was greater happiness and peace for me, I sought for the blessings of the fathers. Now, listen to some of this language. Abraham is seeking for these blessings. And the right whereon, whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same, having myself been a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a greater follower, follower of righteousness and possess a greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace and desiring to receive instructions and to, be, and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest, holding the rights belonging to the fathers. I mean, the language that Abraham is using here is he's already an intelligent man, but he knows there's more for him to understand. He had the records of his fathers. He knew that they had certain, you know, understandings. They had the, the priesthood, and he did not. He wanted it, and so he sought for it. He knew that he needed to be instructed. But who could instruct Abraham? He was living in a place where everyone had forsaken the, the truth. The scriptures, or his, he then goes on to say, my fathers, having turned from their righteousness and from the holy commandments which the Lord their God had given unto them, unto the worshiping of the gods of the heathen, utterly refused to hearken to my voice. So from here we learn that he was trying to preach the gospel to the other Chaldeans. But they utterly refused to hearken unto his voice. And I, I believe that what happens next is directly related to this. 
So Abraham is preaching the gospel. He's trying to get people to stop worshiping these idols. And it appears that he has some limited success. In his record, he says, the priests had offered upon this altar three virgins at one time who were the daughters of Oneida, one of the royal descendants directly from the loins of Ham. These virgins were offered up because of their virtue. They would not bow down to worship gods of wood or stone. Everyone else is. So to me, these three are perhaps, you know, maybe Abraham's only converts. And the priests take them and kill them upon an altar. And then they grab Abraham to kill him upon the same altar. Now, what is going through Abraham's mind at this point? All he wanted was what his fathers had. He wanted to be a greater follower of righteousness and to obtain a greater understanding of the Lord. And what does it get him? He's lying on an altar about to be killed. And then what happens next is very telling. He prays for deliverance. And in bold, it says that the Lord filled him with the vision of the Almighty. To me, this is like an Alma and Amulek experience that Abraham is having. So you know, Alma and Amulek, they're teaching the people of Ammonihah, and their converts are thrown into a fire and burned alive. And Amulek turns to Alma and says, what? We got to stop this. And Alma is filled with the vision of the Almighty. He understands, hey, there is more to this. The Lord sees the end from the beginning. This is a witness of that these people have, uh, have reached a fullness of iniquity. And it's not over for these righteous people that gave their life for their beliefs. I believe that Abraham is now, that's what he's experiencing now. Having just seen these three you know, girls that I'm sure he taught and convinced them die. And then um, Abraham says that the angel of God's presence stood by him and immediately unloosed his bands. And his voice was unto me, Abraham, Abraham, behold, my name is Jehovah, and I have heard thee and have come down to deliver thee and to take thee away from thy father's house, from all thy kinsfolk, into a strange land which thou knowest not of. Therefore, I have come down to visit them and to destroy him who hath lifted up his hand against thee, Abraham, my son, to take away thine life. To me, it's very interesting here that Jehovah, who is the God of Israel, who is Jesus Christ, who many of us refer to as our brother, because aren't we all children of God? But Christ comes to Abraham and calls him his son. Now, when Christ was with the Jews, he said, hey, if you were really the children of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham. So if Jesus Christ is calling him his son, it's because Abraham is doing the works of Christ. You know, in the Book of Mormon, there's a a passage that says this, and now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and daughters. You know, it is not about our lineage. It's about our choices. And Abraham's life is so important because he lived in a society that was utterly corrupt. And the truth was veiled. But he knew that those that had come before him understood more than he knew. He didn't know how he was going to get that knowledge, but he started seeking for it. The Lord here tells him, hey, I'm sending you to a strange land which you know not of. At this point, Abraham doesn't even have the priesthood yet. So it's interesting to understand that the Lord did not lay out the plan to Abraham. Hey, this is everything that you've got to do. And if you look at how the Lord has interacted with his disciples in the past, he has never done that. It's always been people having to learn how to follow the Lord, how to hear his voice, how to obey him for themselves. 
And that's what Abraham's story is about, how he learned to do these things, line upon line and precept upon precept. Dang. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so this is the next passage I wanted to cover. And I took Sarai, which is his wife, whom I took to wife when I was in Ur of Chaldea, and the souls that we had won. Okay, so Abraham's wife is in it with him. They, are, they have won souls. And those souls are going to follow them into this strange land that they know not of either because they believe Abraham's vision. Even though Abraham doesn't have all of the answers, there's a lot on his middle table. But he desires to become a greater follower of righteousness and to have a greater understanding. And so he's doing these things. <clears throat> and they came forth into the land of Canaan and dwelt in tents as they came on their way. So the land of Canaan is, I mean, the Lord told them, hey, it's a strange land. And it, it was a strange land in the days of Abraham. If we want to understand what Abraham was like and how he saw the world, we should try to understand how things really were. And sometimes when things are weird, we don't even talk about it. Now, the land of Canaan was a land of giants, and that's weird. And so we don't really talk about it. Um, when the children of Israel finally got to the land of Canaan, you remember they didn't want to go in. They sent forth some little scouts and emphasis on the little because they said when they were there, they were grasshoppers compared to the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, every one of which was huge. This is weird stuff. Abraham lived in a period where his reality is something totally foreign to what we understand. And I think we would do good to think about that. Now, this is the last verse in the first chapter of Abraham, and I, it's fascinating to me. Listen to this. But the records of the fathers. So first off, right there, Abraham has records that we don't have. Okay? Up to this point, in the King James Bible, you've got 16 pages. And most of those are Adam and Eve in the garden. Abraham has records and that's where he's getting his knowledge. And we don't have those records. So that's something I wanted to point out. But listen to what he says next. I think I find this amazing. But the records of the fathers, even the patriarchs, concerning the right of the priesthood, the Lord, my God, preserved in my hands. So the records were about the covenants that his fathers had made. And now this is the part that blows me away. He says... So that's what the records are about, the covenants the fathers have made. Therefore, a knowledge of the beginning of creation and also of the planets and the stars I've included. What in the world does a knowledge of planets and stars have to do with the covenants their fathers made? You know, to me, that is very interesting and it's something that we should be thinking about. Why does Abraham think that because the, you know, the records talked about those covenants, obviously they were going to talk about other solar systems. The Pearl of Great Price is short. It's 40 pages. It contains three separate accounts of worlds without number. Why? You know, we would do well to think about that. To... Abraham, this was fundamental to his reality. Um, okay, so he continues. As they were made known unto the fathers, and I have kept this even until this day, and I shall endeavor to write some of these things upon this record for the benefit of my posterity that shall come after me. So he thinks that our knowledge of the covenants of the fathers and of other planets and solar systems would be of benefit to us. This is very curious. We shouldn't just be passing over this. Now listen to what Abraham says. There we go. 
I, Abraham, talked with the Lord face to face as one man talked with another. And he told me of the works which his hands had made. And he said unto me, my son, my son. And his hand was stretched out. Behold, I will show unto you all these. And he put his hand upon my eyes, and I saw those things which his hands had made, which were many. And they multiplied before mine eyes, and I could not see the end thereof. So Abraham is realizing that he's not alone, that the Lord is so much greater than he ever had supposed. Moses had a similar experience. He saw worlds without number two. And Moses grew up in Pharaoh's household, who at the time was the most powerful country in the, in the world. And after he saw the Lord and what the Lord had done and his place in all of it, he said, man is nothing, nothing, which thing I never had supposed. I think that this is Abraham's reaction here too. Now, I want to talk about, Abraham said that he had some records. Now, the Doctrine and Covenants gives us insight into at least what one of those uh, books would have been. Adam stood up in the midst of the congregation, and notwithstanding he was bowed down with age, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the latest generation. These things were all written in the book of Enoch and are to be testified of in due time. So the Lord is talking about the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch was a lost book of the Bible, and there were heavy hitters that quote from the book of Enoch. Jesus Christ, Moses, Peter, John, and Jude, the brother of Jesus. They believed that book. <laughs> and the Doctrine and Covenants says the book of Enoch will be testified of in due time. Well, what, what does that even mean? Oh, that works better. <clears throat> so testify means witness to the truthfulness of a given set of circumstances or facts. In other words, what you know, the Doctrine and Covenants was saying is, in the passage of time, you will realize that the book of Enoch is true. If the book of Enoch is true, Abraham would have had that record because Enoch preceded him was one of uh, Abraham's fathers. So what does the book of Enoch talk about? <clears throat> well, the book of Enoch, it's also called the book of the watchers. And like I said, it was a lost book of the Bible. And it wasn't until 1917 that it was translated into English. Now, <laughs> the book of Enoch is kind of like the land of Canaan in that it is weird. And because it's weird, you know, we don't really talk about it very much. But listen to what the book of Enoch says that it is about. This is the first chapter, first verse of the book of Enoch. The blessings of Enoch with which he blessed the elect who would live during the latter days, during the times of trial, when the earth would be purged of wickedness. What days are those? That's now. The book of Enoch was written for us. Listen to this, the next couple of verses. And this is amazing to me. I mean, the God of the universe will come forth from his dwelling. He will march upon the mount, emerging from heaven with mighty power. All shall be afraid, and the watchers shall be terrified. The hills shall melt before him, but the elect will have peace and joy in the splendor of his coming. Behold, he comes with 10,000 of his saints. It's obviously talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, it says that everyone, all, for you, for those of you that math's not your thing, all is a very high percentage. So all the inhabitants of the earth are afraid. But he includes another subcategory. The watchers shall be terrified. Do you know what the book of Enoch says about the watchers? In the book of Enoch, <laughs> I mean, 
it, 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 it sounds crazy. I, mean, I don't even want to say what it says. But the book of Enoch says that in the days of Jared, Enoch's father, 200 men came here from another world. And they brought technology with them that utterly corrupted the earth. Nobody was ready for what these guys brought. They were an agrarian society. They were totally dependent upon the Lord for everything they had. And these watchers come and they introduce all kinds of crazy things. You know, if you haven't read the book of Enoch, you might want to check it out. <clears throat> this next verse, you know, is also fascinating to me. All, again, a very high percentage. All who are in the heavens know what is transacted upon the earth. Think about what that means. Who is Enoch? I mean, what did he even mean when he said all who are in the heavens? I mean, Enoch knew what he was talking about because Enoch had been there, right? He and his entire people had been taken up into the heavens. So if there's anyone that can comment on the heavens, it's Enoch. So I find that fascinating. Everybody out there knows what's going on here. That's what the whole term watchers means. People out there watching what's going on here. Why would they be watching? It's simple. Jesus Christ is why they're watching. Everything that has happened or ever will happen ultimately is based in Jesus Christ. And behold, this is the whole meaning of the law. Every wit pointing to that last and great sacrifice and that great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God. Yea, infinite and eternal. And thus he shall bring salvation to all who shall believe on his name. Again, all. We heard the voice bearing record that Christ is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are the begotten sons and daughters of God. This passage says that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the universe. This is fascinating to me. So Abraham, this is the perspective that Abraham had when he's writing these things. He's beheld things that he couldn't even describe. And he relates those things, curiously, to the priesthood covenants that his fathers had made. So let's unwrap this a little bit more. What else does Abraham teach us? Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among these, there were many of the noble and great ones, and there stood among them one that was like unto God. This is Jesus Christ. Abraham is seen the noble and great ones, foremost of which is the Lord and Savior. And God saw the noble and great ones, that they were good. And he stood in the midst of them, and he said, these I will make my rulers. For he stood among them that were spirits, and he saw that they were good, and he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them, thou wast chosen before thou wast born. And the father said unto the noble and great ones, we will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon the noble and great ones may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. It seems to me that Abraham was taught that this world is unique for other reasons too. Not only is it unique because Jesus Christ came here, it's because it's also unique because the Lord sent his noble and great ones here as well. Or at least many of the noble and great ones. Let's see. So we've talked briefly about Abraham's knowledge of Enoch. He clearly had the book of Enoch. Enoch's people were removed from the earth. 
They lived during a time that was highly unusual. When you read the scriptures, it says that there were giants in, on the earth in those days. There were watchers on the earth in those days. And the earth had become corrupted. And it came to pass that only those people that would listen to Enoch and follow him and accept the gospel were separated out from everyone else. And the time came where they were lifted up and removed from the earth. Abraham knew this. What else did Abraham know? And Enoch beheld angels descending out of heaven, bearing testimony of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Ghost fell on many. And they were caught up by the powers of heaven into the city of Enoch. So this has happened after the city has been removed. Abraham knows that there have been other people that also sought after those same covenants, and they were translated just like the people of the city of Enoch. This is Abraham's reality. This verse comes from chapter 14, which is all about Abraham. And it says, And disciples, having this faith, coming up unto this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. Now, one of the least told stories or understood stories, and one of my favorite stories, comes from Genesis chapter 14. And in this chapter, Abraham and his, those that followed him, the souls that he had won, which were numbered around some 300 people, they're with him, and they're in the land of Canaan, and you know, people don't like the giants. And so some other nations join forces and they go to war against the giants. And they start eliminating some of these cities of the giants. And Sodom and Gomorrah were two of those. And Lot was living there. And so some of the Canaanites come over to Abraham and says, Abraham, your son's gone. Everyone's gone. They came and took him. And when we're talking about the works of Abraham, you have to understand what he did next. So Abraham says, well, let's go get him. You know, the giants weren't succeeding against these guys. But Abraham and his 300 followers go to war against a league of nations. And they defeat them. I wish we knew more about how that happened. But it astounded everyone in the land of Canaan. And Melchizedek, who was living where Jerusalem would one day be, in Salem, he heard of it, and it was a sign to him that Abraham was special. No one could do what Abraham just did unless the Lord was with him. And so, you know, Melchizedek comes to Abraham. And Abraham, when he finds out Melchizedek is the high priest, this is what he wants. He didn't know every step of the way. But now here's Melchizedek right in front of him. And we learn that Abraham receives the Melchizedek priesthood from Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is an incredible figure. Listen to what Abraham understood from Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was a high priest after the order of Enoch. Therefore, he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. Remember, Abraham said he wanted to be a Prince of Peace. Melchizedek was a mentor to Abraham. Abraham wanted to become like Melchizedek. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days. I mean, can you see how different Abraham's view of reality is from ours? I mean, this group of people, they all are taken up. And to me, it seems that Abraham's own disciples that were following him likely joined them. Because Abraham seems to be, it's just him and his family after this. So Abraham has a view of the earth that is much different from what you and I think about. Earth isn't sequestered. 
in Abraham's days, it seems like it's a hot spot. I think that this is very interesting. And I think we need to understand what Abraham understood if we're to be able to really understand him. Now listen to what Joseph Smith taught about the whole reason people are translated in the first place. So, I mean, you have the city of Enoch that's translated. You have Melchizedek and all of his people that are translated. You have a bunch of individuals that are translated. This is what Joseph Smith said. I think this is amazing. Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God. <clears throat> and into an eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. Such characters God held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets. What? <clears throat> I mean, that's amazing. So does that jive with other scriptures that we have? I mean, is that what Enoch and his city are doing? Are they ministering to people on other planets? I mean, listen to this. This is Enoch. And were it possible that men could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earth like it, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creation. So very interesting. Enoch is using huge numbers. I mean, if you do the math on this, it's a number with like 40 zeros after it. And, you know, the unit of measure is earth-like planets. And then he says this speaking to the Lord. And Lord, you have taken my city to your own bosom from all thy creations. So what does that mean? In the context of what Enoch was talking about, it's worlds without number. The city of Enoch is administering to other people. To me, that is eye-opening. Well, listen to this. The prophet once gave a blessing to Orson Pratt in the course of which he spoke in an unknown tongue, naming several worlds which he, as a servant of the Most High God, should visit in order to minister to their inhabitants. Wow. If any of you have ever listened to the Truman Madsen lectures on Joseph Smith, you'll find out this isn't the only time this happened. There was once a meeting in Nauvoo and a woman stands up, and she starts speaking in tongues. And Joseph Smith, he's conducting this meeting. Everyone looks at him and goes, what is she saying? And he says, she just listed a bunch of worlds that I'm going to go minister to. Is not the reckoning of God's time, angel's time, prophet's time, and man's time according to the planet on which they reside? I answer, yes. But there are no angels who minister to this earth, but those who do or have belonged to it. That's an unusual thing to be in the Doctrine and Covenants, isn't it? No one comes and ministers to us here unless you're from here. But the inverse of that is not true. Could this be tying back to what Abraham understood of what priesthood covenants might mean? If you look at minister in the you know, dictionary, it says that minister is an authorized representative that administers religious ordinances. So in other words, people from other worlds aren't coming here and administering religious ordinances to us. But it seems that the inverse of that isn't true. Now, this is Wilford Woodruff, and he was a visionary man. I mean, he once saw one of my family members in the, in the um, St. George Temple, who asked for his temple work to be done, and he did it for him. So he sees Joseph Smith in the spirit world, and he's amazed by what happens. Listen, Joseph said he could not stop and talk with me because he was in a hurry, as did all the other former leaders he met in that dream. I think this is funny. I expected my hurry would be over when I got into the kingdom of heaven. Joseph said, we are the last dispensation and so much work has to be done and we need to be in a hurry in order to accomplish it. 
I mean, the gospel has been preached to the dead for thousands of years now. This is, this is interesting to me. Now, Phil mentioned parables. Jesus Christ gives a parable in the Doctrine and Covenants that blows my mind. And I think it will blow yours. Now listen to what he says. And there are many kingdoms, for there is no space, and I underlined space there because if you look at the reference here in the Bible Dictionary, it says, see astronomy. So it's talking about outer space. There are, there, there are many kingdoms, for there is no space in which there is no kingdom, either a greater or a lesser kingdom. And then he goes in and gives a parable about outer space. Listen. Behold, I will liken these kingdoms unto a man having a field. And he sent forth his servants into the field to dig in the field. And he said unto the first, Go ye and labor in the field. And in the first hour I will come unto you, and ye shall behold the joy of my countenance. And he said unto the second, Go ye also in the field, and in the second hour I will visit you with the joy of my countenance. And also unto the third, saying, I will visit you. And unto the fourth, and so on, unto the twelfth. That his Lord might be glorified in him, and he in his Lord. What is the Lord talking about here? What's Christ talking about? He's talking about the family business, which is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men across the universe. Not just here. Then the Lord goes on to say, "Therefore I will liken this par- or, therefore unto this parable I will liken all these kingdoms and the inhabitants thereof." We're talking about people living on other worlds. Every kingdom in its hour, in its time, and in its season, even according to the decree which God hath made. And again, verily I say unto you, my friends, I leave these sayings with you to ponder in your hearts. I think you should be pondering in your heart, why did he divide it into 12? Now, space is big. It's an interesting parable for us to ponder. Now, listen to this passage from John. John is unique because as he's writing his record, he's doing so as a translated being. If you recall what happened to the three Nephites when they were translated, they were caught up into heaven and they saw incredible things that they could not describe or were not permitted to describe. The same thing happened to John. This is the verse that John closes his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ with. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. I mean, if we had reality TV down there, we could have had 34 episodes of Jesus Christ's life. And those could have fit on a single iCloud account. So what is John talking about that the earth itself could not hold these things? I think that John is talking about this from the perspective of what is happening out there. If you use Enoch's numbers, you know, where he says, hey, you take a million Earths, break it down to their particles, and multiply that by a million, millions of others, it's not even the beginning. This is the perspective that John is coming from. If each of those worlds has scriptures like ours, and let's just say our scriptures weigh a pound, If you multiply that by the number of other worlds that we're talking about, it exceeds the entire mass of our solar system by billions of times. This is what John is talking about. This is amazing. Reality is not what we think it is. It's much more than that. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought and his angels. And the great dragon was cast out, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, for thine accuser is cast down. But woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath. 
this seems to be another reason that this earth is unique. We've got, it's, you know, opposition here that is unique in all the universe. To me, I mean, this is, you know, the gospel according to Michael Rush. But listen to what Christ tells his apostles. And you ask yourself, what is the context of this? I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Meaning, you guys are my peers. We did this together down here. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones. You know, there's some very interesting doctrines here to be pondered. And I'm not telling you that I've got all the answers for these things. But to me, it seems that the gospel is vast. That there are levels of understanding here that are mind-boggling. And we would do well not to close our minds, like the Jews did. But have an open mind and seek to be taught by the Lord, rather than by other men, myself included. It, it really doesn't matter a fig what I say. It only matters what the Lord tells you and what he teaches you. He wants to teach you. The whole heavens weep over the earth, even all the workmanship of my hands. Wherefore, should not the heavens weep, seeing the earth's inhabitants shall suffer? Again, from a scriptural perspective, it seems that everyone's watching us, observing what's taking place here. Now, I want to talk about something briefly, because this is science stuff, and anytime I talk about science stuff, some people don't like it. But um, I think, I mean, if you haven't looked through the Hubble telescope images on the internet, you got to. It, it's amazing. I mean, scientists now estimate there's some two trillion galaxies. And galaxies seem to be random. I mean, they're oriented all over the place. But quasars are also galaxies, but they're unique. I mean, look at what's going on in the galactic bulge here in a quasar. Something weird. It's blasting out energy on a pole. They're all the same. They all do it the same. There is a quasar alignment. Now, why am I talking about quasars right now? Because this isn't the only alignment that exists in space. And when scientists start digging into this stuff, what they find terrifies them. And I want to... I want to talk about this again briefly because it's so cool. So this is an image of what's called the cosmic uh, microwave, microwave background. It's basically the temperature of space. That the measurements reach across 93 billion light years. And it's taken us a long time and many different satellites to compile and verify this data because of what the data suggests is happening. So I mentioned to you that there's a quasar alignment. All quasars seem to line up with this orientation in space. But there's two other orientations in space. And those two other orientations are coming from, basically, you take the hot and cold spots in space from the you know, background microwave radiation, and you can you know, basically do like these scatter plots, and they come up with planes. And these planes exist throughout the enormity of space. There's the dipole plane, the quadra, and octopole plane. You can see that they're slightly different from each other. But anyone who has the technology to measure these things, it basically creates, I mean, there is a coordinate system in the very fabric of space itself. The quasar alignment is at an exact 90 degree angle to the quadra and octopole you know, plane. And that is 23.44 degrees from the dipole plane. Now, why in the world am I even talking about this? Because of this. All of those things center on and, and point to that there's a center to all of this. There's a, a point of origin. And this is what is so scary. 
That is the point of origin. The center of all of those is the earth. <laughs> and I mean, I encourage you to go out and look at this yourself, but it gets even stranger than that. The right here, this quasi, the, the quasar alignment is the earth's north and south pole. The quadrupole plane is the equatorial plane of the earth. The dipole plane is the Earth's orbital, pl orbital plane around the sun. And when you look at the very center of all of those three different you know, axes, you have the point in Earth's elliptical orbit of the winter and summer solstice, the longest and shortest days on planet Earth. Because this cannot be coincidental, scientists have dubbed this whole phenomenon the axis of evil. Because it's, it threatens to turn everything upside down. Earth isn't special. You know, we're not the center of the universe. Well, according to this findings, it seems that everything is pointing here. If you can take these measurements again, anywhere in the universe, it points you here. I encourage you, I mean, I understand this sounds too crazy to believe, and that's why scientists have done so many studies on it, because it has to be wrong. But Google it. Google the axis of evil. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so once again, according to the Book of Enoch, all who are in the heavens know what is transacted upon the earth. I believe that that is true. Now, I want to get back to Abraham, because this is the thing that I think that we really need to understand. Um, and the most important thing that most people point to about Abraham is the covenant that he made with the Lord, known as the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this is how the Lord prefaces the covenant that he makes with Abraham. For I am the Lord thy God. I dwell in heaven. The earth is my footstool. I stretch my hand over the sea, and it obeys my voice. I cause the winds and the fire to be my chariot. I say unto the mountains, depart hence, and behold, they are taken away by a whirlwind in an instant suddenly. In other words, the Lord is prefacing the Abrahamic covenant by saying, listen, I am a supernatural being. I do not have to obey the laws of Newtonian physics. And we would do well to understand that ourselves. The Abrahamic covenant, oh, I underlined the word footstool. Now that's interesting. Now, Nephi, he saw incredible things in vision, which he was not permitted to describe. But shortly after he concludes his vision, he starts writing about Isaiah, and he says this, he ruleth high in the heavens, for it is his throne, and this earth is his footstool. That's kind of weird that he says, this earth. There's many, innumerable worlds. Aren't they all his footstools? A footstool and a throne are kind of a package deal. I think that this is pointing to the fact that you know, the Lord, when he says, hey, this earth, I'm, I'm creating a place down here where the noble and great ones will be tested. And I'm going to make my rulers from them. And then we learn these strange and unique things about planet earth. There's a reason behind all of these things. Now, continuing to the Abrahamic covenant. My name is Jehovah, and I know the end from the beginning. And that should be very comforting to all of us especially as we see things get crazier and crazier and crazier. He knows the end from the beginning, and he's prepared in advance. My hand shall be over thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee above measure, and make thy name great among all nations. And thou shalt be a blessing unto thy seed after thee, that there in their hands they shall bear this ministry and priesthood unto all nations." Based off of some of the things that we have read, all nations may be very interesting indeed. 
And I will bless the nations through, the, through thy name. For as many as received this gospel shall be called after thy name and shall be accounted thy seed and shall rise up and bless thee as their father, meaning the house of Israel. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee and thy seed, for I give unto thee a promise that this right shall continue in thee and in thy seed after thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed, even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even of life eternal. If we are to be the seed of Abraham, if we want Abraham to be our father, we need to do the works of Abraham, the things that he did. And Abraham, and this is very important, and Abraham said, Lord, God, how? Abraham didn't see any of these covenants come to pass in his lifetime. He was a very old man. He saw his son, certainly wasn't nations, he didn't even inherit the, land of, the lands of Canaan in his day. So he's asking the Lord, I believe you, but how? I'm about to die. And the Lord said, though thou wast dead, yet am I not able to give it to thee? And if thou shalt die, yet thou shalt possess it. In other words, if you make covenants with me, I will keep those covenants and my timeline isn't mortality. Now, after the Lord had withdrawn from speaking to me and withdrawn his face from me, I said in my heart, thy servant has sought thee earnestly. Now I have found thee. Abraham sought the Lord and found the Lord. Are we seeking the Lord? Are these Abraham's covenants or are they our covenants? That's, I think, what it comes down to. You know, the Jews, it was the covenants and faith of their fathers that made them special. That's not what Christ thought. If we want to know the God that we worship, we need to do the things that he would have us do. We need to follow him. Now listen to this. This is Moroni, who, again, talking about what reality really is, appears to Joseph Smith five times in a 24-hour period. Some of those times, he descends through his roof as a resurrected being. He stands above the floor, and he tells him this. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers. And the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. In other words, we should be seeking out the covenants that our fathers made, just like Abraham did. They shouldn't be our father's covenants. They should be our covenants. And to underscore the importance of this, if it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. These covenants are important. Listen to what President Nelson said about this. The gathering of Israel is the most important thing taking place on earth today. Nothing else compares in magnitude. Nothing else compares in importance. Nothing else compares in majesty. You were sent to the earth at this present time, the most crucial time in the history of the world, to help gather Israel. There is nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. There is nothing of greater consequence. Absolutely nothing. That's surprising. This should be a priority to us, just as it was to Abraham. Anytime we do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil to make and keep their covenants with God, we are helping to gather Israel. Now, going back to the book of Enoch, there's a very interesting passage in the book of Enoch in chapter 39, verse 1. It shall come to pass in those days, the last days of trial, that the children of the holy race will descend from the heavens and their seed will become one with their brethren. 
What does that mean? Who is the holy race? And they're going to come down and mingle with their brethren, meaning they have brethren here? This is talking about the restoration of the house of Israel, which is going to be spectacular. See, there's a gathering and there's a restoration. The scriptures talk about this. This isn't just the book of Enoch being strange and obtuse. Listen to Moses. If any of thine, meaning the house of Israel, be driven out to the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. He shall send his angels to gather his elect from one end of heaven to the other. I have covered thee, Israel, in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of earth and say unto Zion, Behold, thou art my people. The scriptures talk about these kinds of things. There's more. I could literally list many more, but I'm not going to. Though there were any of you cast to the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Nehemiah 1.9. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall burn as stubble. For they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones. They shall come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How will ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the last 10 tribes. These, there is something spectacular that is talked about in the scriptures, but that we gloss over because it doesn't fit with our reality, the way that we see the world. So we dismiss it. And we dismiss it to our own detriment because that is exactly what the Jews did. Now listen to what the people that knew the most about this stuff said about it. I, Nephi, am forbidden that I should write the remainder of the things which I saw and heard. Others, Isaiah was one of them, who have been, to them he hath shown all things, and they have written them. Nephi saw these things, and he couldn't write about it. And other people wrote it, and the way that they wrote it is kind of hard to understand. It's kind of hard to unpack Isaiah. <laughs> but... Nephi is saying there's something there. He transcribes some of these chapters of Isaiah and he starts to explain what they mean. And then he says, and now I, Nephi, make an end, for I durst not speak further as yet concerning these things. The Lord tells him, stop. Why? This is how Nephi ends his record. I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance, and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men. He's kind of upset with what he sees happening amongst the Gentiles. He knows that they have his record. For they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as the word can be. Wherefore, now, after I have transcribed these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. Clearly, there is something that we are supposed to be going to the Lord for here. You don't know how many times I hear things like, well, if this is true, why don't the general authorities talk about this? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question, and it's a valid question. Why did the Lord speak in parables to his people? Why was the fact that the Son of God was the greatest mystery of the Old Testament? Why does the Lord want his people to seek him and be taught from him? We have general authorities that give us general counsel but if we want specific instruction in our lives, you go to the Lord. That is the message 
these people are trying to say. Nephi wasn't the only one. This is Mormon. He's abridging Nephi or the people of Nephi's records, specifically Christ and his message to the Nephites. And he wants to explain it all. Behold, I was about to write them all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should have it first, to try their faith, and if it so be that they shall believe these things, then shall greater things be made manifest unto them. How, I wonder? It's through the administration of the Holy Ghost. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then the greater things will be withheld from them unto their condemnation. I mean, when the Lord begins his sermon to the Nephites, he says, listen, guys, when I was amongst the Jews, I told them other sheep I have which are not of this fold. And they didn't understand what I was talking about. They presumed that I was talking about the Gentiles, but I wasn't. And because they didn't seek any more knowledge on that, I didn't tell them anything else. My father didn't let me. But I'm telling you now that you are the other sheep that I was talking about. And now I'm also telling you that I've got other sheep that aren't in any of those lands, and I am going to go and talk to them, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one fold and there will be one shepherd. Now, we should be having little alarms going off in our minds because he, tells us, he says the Jews didn't ask anything about him, so they didn't know anything about these guys. There's other guys too. We should be asking about those things. And he gives the most magnificent sermon on this. And it's important to understand that he's talking to the entire house of Israel as if they were present. The people in Jerusalem, the Gentiles of the last days, the Nephites, and then he refers to a remnant of the house of Jacob, which are the lost tribes of Israel. So clearly, there is something about all of this that the Lord intends for us to seek out ourselves. He's not just going to lay it out there for us. This is Moroni. He's abridged the records of Ether. And I just pulled a couple of you know, things that he's talking about out of you know, Ether chapter 13, which is a marvelous chapter. And he says, Wherefore the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, meaning America. There shall be a new heaven and a new earth. What does that mean? Then cometh the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven. What? Then also cometh the Jerusalem of old. They whom were the first shall be last, and they who were last shall be first. I was about to write more, but I am forbidden. Do you see here that there is something that we are intended to seek out for ourselves? And if we will have an open mind and if we will seek for the Lord, we will be amazed by what he is willing to share with us. This is Alma and Amulek. This is what they described to the people of Ammonihah. It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict commandment that they shall not impart only according to a portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. Are you giving heed and diligence unto the Lord? Are you seeking the Lord? Or are you content with what anyone else will tell you about him? Is all you need to know about the Lord what someone else will teach you? And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until he knoweth them in full. Now we have this negative connotation of the mysteries of God in the church. That there's some fringe doctrines and we don't talk about those things. But the fact is, is that Jesus Christ was the greatest mystery of the, oldest, of the Old Testament. And it was vital to the salvation of the Jews to understand that, and they didn't. Now, I'm going to you know, wrap up but by saying, I mean, what are the con what's the context of the last days? That, I mean, how should we be looking at all of these things that are happening around us? You know, there's people that are, you know, 
concerned and always have been concerned by some of these signs of the times that have been taking place ever since there were people on this planet in the first place. Well, I, I talk about you know, three of these things often, but if any of you have ever read any of my books, there's a fourth one that's woven throughout everything that I write. And I don't explicitly talk about it because it's weird. But let me just briefly touch on these four things that I think are vital for us to understand. The first is that the horror of Babylon is absolutely real. There are secret combinations. There is a narrative that is being manipulated. There is an agenda. And if you don't understand that when the prophets who saw our day and talked about the horror of Babylon were not lying, then you can be deceived. You need to understand that this is a vital context to the events of the last days. The horror of Babylon is real. A powerful antichrist is coming. When the apostles talked to the Lord on the Mount of Olives, they said, tell us about what your coming is going to be like. He tells them, listen, there will be false prophets and antichrists that even the very elect according to the covenant will be deceived by these guys. The scriptures that talk about this coming Antichrist and what he can do, just don't, it, it falls beyond our current reality. The prophets who have spoken of him, you know, they talk about a total collapse of faith. Our prophet tells us, listen, you will not survive the coming day unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you need to know for yourself, this guy is going to be something different. The restoration of the house of Israel will change everything. There is something here that is incredible. Something beyond our current reality of things. It is spoken about throughout the scriptures. And people always, either it's written about cryptically or they say, I can't tell you anything else. But Christ teaches the Nephites and then says, listen, ye ought to study the words of Isaiah. No, a commandment I give you to search these things. And then we have 19 Isaiah chapters transcribed in the Book of Mormon. Is that a coincidence? Every one of those Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon talks about this. Every single one of them. The Lord wants us to be prepared, but only if we are going to listen to him and seek him and have him teach us about these things. And the last thing is that we live in an infinite universe. And the plan of salvation applies everywhere. We're not living in a vacuum. That was the way that Abraham understood things. I mean, he saw people coming and going. We don't understand any of those things. It's, it's different for us. But I think that we need to think about these things. Like the Lord said, ponder them in our hearts. Now, a couple more quotes from President Nelson. As you study your scriptures, I encourage you to make a list of all that the Lord has promised he will do for covenant Israel. I think you will be astounded. Ponder these promises. Talk about them with your friends and family. Then live and watch for these promises to be fulfilled in your own life. This is what he's talking about. But he wants you to go and study these things. I love this quote. I urge you, this is President Nelson again, I urge you to stretch beyond your current spiritual ability to receive personal revelation. In other words, your current state isn't enough, guys, for what's coming. Stretch yourselves, grow. Oh, there is so much more that your Father in heaven wants you to know. Now, the very fact that he is saying this is that I'm not going to be the one to tell you these things. The Lord wants you to know these. As Elder Neil A. Maxwell has taught, to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it is clear that the Father and the Son are giving away the secrets of the universe. 
Friends, that is true. That is happening. For those that will seek, you will find. Time is running out. Do the necessary spiritual work, President Nelson says. I want to conclude my presentation with this last passage out of the book of Enoch. Or this is actually Moses 7, but it's talking about Enoch's conversation with the Lord about the last days. Enoch has been mourning for what's been transpiring on the earth. And the Lord reminds him of the covenants that he's made. As I live, even so will I come in the last days, in the days of wickedness and vengeance, to fulfill the oath which I have made. Then shall thou and all thy city and all other translated beings, Melchizedek and his people, meet them there. And we will receive them into our bosom, and they shall see us, and we shall fall upon their necks, and they shall fall upon our necks, and we will kiss each other. And there shall be mine abode, and it shall be Zion, which shall come forth out of all the creations which I have made. Friends, that is a very meaningful passage. There is far more Star Wars to the millennium than you're prepared to understand. The things that are about to transpire on the earth are fantastic. They're amazing. They're exciting. If you study them, it makes you feel like you're a part of something spectacular. And I fear for the rising generation because they, they don't feel the wonder and awe and gloriousness of the gospel. But it's kind of like what Brandon was talking about, all these different things that kind of cloud your vision. We need to help people to understand these things. And they're weird. It's, it's hard to have a conversation with people about these things. But, you know, there's a reason that the Lord works the way that he does. He wants us to grow. I mean, if the Lord wanted the gospel to be easy, he could have done some things that were much easier than what he did, right? You know, ruins that have Hebrew writing all over them, for instance. You know, but the Lord doesn't seem to be interested at all about trying to make it easy. He seems to be interested in proving us and allowing us to exercise our free agency to seek him. And if we draw near unto him, he will draw near unto us. And I know that that is true. And I leave this message with you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.